Live from San Francisco, it's Rex Broadcasting Wrestling Observer with Dave Meltzer and Brian Alvarez. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's get it on! How's it going, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer. Brian Alvarez and I are going to be here for two hours talking pro wrestling, taking your phone calls. We actually have a full bank of phone calls today, which stuns me to no end because there's a football game going on that Brian, I thought Brian and I were like the only two people in the nation that weren't going to be watching. But uh, anyway, we've got two hours to talk about pro wrestling. And actually, over the last two weeks, there has been a, just a ton going on. Um, among those things, of course, the Tough Enough Finals on uh, a Tuesday, well, it was a Thursday of this week. Um, we've got uh, the Royal Rumble, which was on la- which was last week. Hulk Hogan and Steve Austin back in WWE. Uh, the Rock, who will be back in WWE any week now and actually wrestling at No Way Out. Uh, what else do we have? Um, just tons of other stuff. Brian, of course, the Sheik passed away last weekend as well. Brian, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. What? Did you have any thoughts? And I, we'll get probably more to this um, after the break, but... Um, as, as far as the Sheik and everything? I'm still reading your bio of him, and it is so interesting. Just the stories of how into a, into a person's wrestling character a guy can get. Well, he was. And uh, you don't see it so much today, but reading stories about how people would call the house to get bookings and ask for Ed, because his real name was Ed Farhat, and he would say, there's no Ed living here. And this was him saying this. Yes, yes, <laughs> it was him saying this. He, he was a very interesting man. Well, there was no Grandpa Ed either when his grandkids called. Yep. Nope, it was it was Grandpa Sheik. And Mrs. Sheik. And, and, and Mrs. Sheik. That's true. Who used to be the, you know, that she used to be the, the slave girl in the 50s. Oh, really? That was the same woman? Yeah, Joyce was the, the slave girl from like 58 to 62, yeah. Amazing how that happens. <laughs> Why, you expect it to happen to you or something? I did not say that. <laughs> okay. Um, how's Portland Wrestling while we're at it? That's fun. It's going good. That's good. Um, I've seen... Uh, actually, I've only seen three weeks of TV, so I'm, uh, I haven't even seen last night's show yet. Now, has, has Ed Moretti retired, or is that out the window? It was a... Uh, I guess I can reveal it. It was a swerve. Well, I, I knew it was a swerve. I'm just wondering, how'd the swerve go? He is back as the evil moon dog. Okay. And he uh, put a lit cigar in the grappler's eyeball, and they will be feuding. Yeah. And apparently he did another drop kick, so <laughs> <laughs> he's feeling it. I guess he is. Wow. Anyway, uh, we're going to come back. We've got so much to talk about. We'll start taking phone calls as well. Uh, when someone hangs up, you can call us at 1-800-878-PLAY. And uh, there's all kinds of subjects to talk about. And we're going to come back, actually, and talk a little bit about the Royal Rumble and the March to WrestleMania. Right after this, you're listening to the Wrestling Observer live on the Sports Byline USA Radio Network. Welcome back to the show. I'm Dave Meltzer, editor of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter with Brian Alvarez of Figure Four Weekly. And we're here for two hours every Sunday night, even against the Super Bowl, from, uh, from 5 to 7 Pacific Time. 8 to 10 Eastern Time here for Wrestling Observer Live. But I don't want to remind you, if we actually have a guest booked for next week ahead of time, usually I try to wait until late in the week so we can kind of like figure out what's going on in the news and get someone who's kind of newsworthy. But uh, next week we will have John Molinaro, who is the author of the recently released book, The Top 100 of All Time, which is quite a debatable issue. And I actually don't. Do you have, do you have, your, do you have a copy of that book yet, Brian? No, not yet. Uh, neither do I. Uh, I was supposed to get one. I, was, I edited it, and I don't even have it. It's been out for several weeks. But anyway, um, uh, listing 100 wrestlers, top 100 wrestlers in order of all time is no easy feat. And anyway, anyone who wants to talk about that, next week you can do it. Actually, you can do that today as well because uh, I'm kind of uh, in the mood to talk about that if the subject comes up. Um, let's see. As far as uh, what were your thoughts on the Royal Rumble? I love the Angle-Benoit match, and I thought the Rumble was – pretty good so to me that saved the show because before that it had been uh it had ranged from uh decent to extremely horrible and steiner versus hunter delivered to my expectations as being a quite quite horrible match Did you know that it was better than i expected really yes that's See, what when, when i read the thing that you wrote on the website about that match i thought is dave watching the same show as me because i thought that match was so atrocious yeah, I, I I guess maybe I was just expecting... See, I've seen Steiner wrestle in Japan, so I knew how bad he was going to be, and Hunter did a good job of carrying him, because that's better than he is in Japan. Yeah, 
I had low expectations going in, but this exceeded those low expectations by a lot. I don't know why. You know, Hunter has got to get it out of his head. Okay, just as an example, the best wrestler in the world in the early 70s, who was world champion and then considered one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. But when he wrestled the Sheik, he did not say, we're going to go 20 minutes, even though against everybody else, he went from 20 to 60 minutes. Yeah. When he wrestled the Sheik, he went eight minutes. It's because the Sheik was only good for eight minutes. And also, the Sheik wasn't going to go more than eight minutes, no matter what he said anyway. But Hunter needs to realize that because he's the world champion and he wants to be a throwback to the old days, if Scott Steiner was around in the old days, or someone with the limited ability of Scott Steiner, you know, they might not have gone 20 minutes. They might have only gone eight minutes, and he really should have gone eight minutes. You know what Hunter needs to learn, and this is a very bitter pill to have to swallow, that he's not Ric Flair. You know what else? He, he, he's, he's not Hunter anymore either. Yeah. You know, let alone Ric Flair. But, but you're right. But uh, he's, determ he's bound and determined, and uh, I think it's going to be the undoing of what was at one point looking like a pretty great career, although I think it's really, you know, the ruination of his career was the leg injury. I don't think there's any question oh, yeah. about that. And the thing was, I don't think that Flair could have uh, carried Steiner to a 20-minute match. He could not have. But the brief moment that Flair was in the ring with Steiner, he knew exactly what to do with a guy like that. But he, he would. I've seen Flair with, like, Nikita Koloff, who was, when Flair wrestled Nikita Koloff, was far worse than Steiner, um, do... I wouldn't saw him do a 35. Although, by then, Nikita was probably better than Steiner is now. But, yeah. but when, you know, still, still do 20 minutes and, you know, make it, I mean, it would be terrible today, but then it was great. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, the people loved it. Yeah. And the people did not love this match. No, they did not. I think that was a lot more important than, like, us saying the match was bad, was that the live audience just hated this thing. Yeah. And, I mean, you could tell in, like, the first two minutes there was a small pack of fans starting the Steiner Sucks chant. But then when he tried that Tiger Driver and fell down, that was the end. Yeah, yeah. Well, dude, he was out there for too long, and he kept doing belly-to-belly -belly suplexes. Yeah. And horrible-looking forearms. Um, but, yeah, as far as uh, I thought the um, Angle Benoit match was early candidate for match of the year. Yeah. Tremendous match. Sure. Tremendous match. Um, let's see. I mean, more than just that, I think that that was – I think that more than any other match made Benoit. If they follow up on it, if they and, and they didn't do a good job on, on Thursday of following up on it, in my opinion. I mean, if they had done a big music video, this was his big triumph and all that, it, it could have made him. I don't know that it did. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess we'll find out this Thursday because, if they, you know, again, if you don't follow up on the story, there's, there's no story in wrestling. So well, things can also be made in the eyes of Vince, and he's such a mark for that big pop that I think that the big ovation after the match meant a lot. Yeah, but... It paled to the big ovation on Thursday. Well, that's true. And that's but at least on the good side, the big ovation on Thursday is leading to a program with Vince and not anyone else right now. Um, I hope. I think... Don't okay, press uh, okay, okay, okay. It will lead to a match with Hulk Hogan and Vince McMahon at WrestleMania. Okay? But probably something else first. Well, Hulk Hogan's going to be wrestling the Rock at No Way Out first. Yeah. And the thing is, is that after... You, you don't expect the guy to go home after WrestleMania. I mean, like, Prudence says, okay, and then he goes home. But we haven't, you know, if he's getting, if he gets a big pop and beats Vince McMahon, Vince McMahon will probably, you know, go, hey, let's put him against, uh, I don't know, Brock, Le you know, I guess it won't be Brock Lesnar because they're both baby faces, but maybe let's put him over Kurt Angle. Mm. Yeah, I, actually, I don't think he'll do that, but he'll, it, it'll be tempting. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what, what they're going to do. Steve Austin officially announced on Monday, well, actually, it was not announced as being back. It was announced that he's been invited back, but he is coming back. Um, that's pretty much official, and, uh, well, I think the odd man out of this whole equation is Bill Goldberg, because if they're bringing all these guys back, if they got The Rock, they got Steve Austin, and they got Hulk Hogan all back, um, and Vince McMahon wrestling at WrestleMania, I think that it's total overkill to bring back Bill Goldberg, because, you know, once, once you overshadow Lesnar and Angle, and I'm afraid they may do that, then you're doing more harm than good by bringing all these guys back. I mean, one special attraction, two special attractions for Mania is good, more than that, I think you're, you, you know, you're not going to get any extra buys, and you start working against the guys that are going on the road, you know, and, you know, you have to build the new stars that you have to build. Yeah. What about the gimmick with uh, the keys often coming back at the pay-per-view, and then the pay-per-view he reveals he's going to SmackDown. So the very next day on Raw, Bischoff goes, I got an even bigger name then, and brings in Goldberg. Well, that's a possibility. At least you're positioning him then as a, you know, but it's, but it's but, 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 but still overkill. Yeah. 
I mean, that's the problem. Anyway, let's go to the lines. We're going to start in Syracuse, New York with Aaron. Aaron, what's going on? Hey, guys. How you doing tonight? Doing really good. All right. Uh, I just want to make a comment. Uh, I was at the SmackDown tapings on uh, Tuesday night. I just got to say that uh, it was absolutely incredible. I mean, the ovation Hogan got was just absolutely off the charts. Yes, it was. I mean, that was uh, definitely the, the biggest pop I've ever seen in person. I've been to. That's one of the biggest pops I've ever seen in my life. God, it was just awesome. That surpassed Montreal. Remember that one? Yeah, well, and then the Montreal, I think, was the biggest I ever saw. So, I mean, I've seen bigger pops, but I've never seen them go as long. Yeah, that was just insane. And I know they, you know, they cut it a little bit on uh, TV, you know, to splice it up to, to fit commercially and all that. But it was just incredible, just nonstop. And he looked so visibly moved. It was just it was unreal. Well, I think he was trying to set a record, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he was definitely uh, playing into it a little bit. Oh, yeah. But, uh, and, and matter of fact, I think the uh, February pay-per-view is in Montreal, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes. Uh-oh. Yes, it is. Well, that should be uh, quite interesting. Now, they're definitely bringing The Rock back as a heel for that match. Is that what I'm... Uh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So they got yeah. to play it into the, the finish, where he'll turn heel at the finish of the match, or... Uh, they may. I, I mean, I don't know how they're going to do the storyline. They they may turn him heel to finish. They may just bring. He's going to be. The, you know, in Montreal, he's going to be the heel anyway. Those people right. in Montreal have been waiting to boo the Rock for a year now. Now the other question I had was with so many uh, top names heading into to WrestleMania. Uh, where do a lot of these mid card guys? Uh, they they end up becoming. Uh, well, they're going to still be mid card guys on the road because none of these top guys are going to be working right. a lot of house shows. But as far as WrestleMania goes, if you add up all the top guys and you get about seven or eight matches, especially if you throw in like Jericho and, and Sean, if they're going to go that way with those two guys, I think they're going to do that one at No Way No Way Out. But if they don't, they'll, they'll for sure do it at WrestleMania. But you're right, no. I figure Nash will probably get a match at WrestleMania. Nash, Nash, he's certainly going to angle for one. Um, Didn't Sean say that the, his idea for the program with Jericho led through Mania? Yeah. Well, then there you go. Well, if they're going to do that, you're right. What's going to happen is a lot of the guys that yeah, were like expecting edge. the RVDs and the edges that were expecting a big WrestleMania payoff because they were going to be high in the card um, are not going to get it. They'll be in the opening match of Battle Royal. <laughs> you got to figure you got to throw the Undertaker in there. He's a big name. Undertaker's going to, yeah, they're going to protect the Undertaker at WrestleMania. Show. Yeah, probably you know over Big Show. Undertaker and Big Show are wrestling at No Way Out. I know that. Are they? Gonna, yeah, yeah. 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 But, but they, that just, they, may, they may do a second meeting. Right. It's just to protect his, uh, his undefeated streak, but I just figured, like you said, guys like RVD and Edge are going to just get totally buried, you know, this WrestleMania. Rey Mysterio may get buried, yeah. Yep. I mean, it's yeah. unless they, you know... Even, 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 even Benoit. Yeah, any possibility of them going maybe four hours to try to... Well, uh, they will. Oh, they are going to go four hours. Yeah, I mean, they did it last year, or three and a half, or whatever. Yeah, they did it last year. I, I'm sure they'll do it again this year, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, they'd almost have to, to, you know, to give these guys any chance to... Uh, in hell to uh, to pull anything off, some of these mid card guys. Yeah, yeah. I just had to call in and just say, yeah, to be in there in person it was the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen with the the pop for Hogan. It's amazing after all these years, he still gets the the reaction that he gets, and I've never. Well, he's really gonna get he's gonna get a ten, he's gonna get it ten years from now even bigger. Yeah. I, I watch Anoki. It, it doesn't it doesn't go away. <laughs> unbelievable, and I'm. <laughs> and it'll never go away. Well, guys, you have a good night. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, you're very welcome. Um, what are your thoughts watching that thing? The ovation? Yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, to me, it didn't it didn't surprise. I, I knew when he came back he would get that. And also get something close get to that, one, too. But I didn't expect him to get that one. Yeah. The one thing that kept going through my mind is, what is it about this man? That's what I just kept thinking over and over as they wouldn't shut up. Eh, it's, it's one, they didn't expect him. Yeah. Um, and the other one is, is that he's become a real sympathetic character. Yeah. Because they didn't read his book. <laughs> anyway, we'll be back with more right after this. You're listening to Wrestling Observer Live on the Sports Byline USA Radio Network. Okay, welcome back to Wrestling Observer Live. I'm Dave Meltzer, editor of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter with Brian Alvarez of Figure Four Weekly. And if you're interested in subscription information on either of those two publications, you can go to www.wrestlingobserver.com anytime. We always have... Uh, Every every afternoon we got new news di- new d- news updates, uh, TV reviews, things like that all week long on the site as well as information in both publications. And I have not gotten Figure Four this week, but I have heard about Figure Four this week, and I'm really upset that I didn't get it on Saturday like usual. So I don't know what to say about it other than um, I don't know what to say about it. I, I guess it was funny. That's good to know. Yeah. So anyway. Um, but this week's issue of The Observer is a big story on The Sheik. Next week's probably another story on The Sheik as well as, uh, actually we're going to run down a lot of what's going on between now and WrestleMania. And we got a really in-depth article on Tough Enough. And I guess we should talk about Tough Enough right now. 
Um, this was the least controversial picks. I mean, usually when Tough Enough, after the, uh, the day after Tough Enough, and I sure remember after Tough Enough 2, I woke up with like, you know, 150 emails that Jake got robbed, and I actually was in the mood that morning to write back, and I explained to everyone that Jake, in fact, did not get robbed, and actually those decision, the decision for Tough Enough 2, which in hindsight doesn't look so good at the time, was the right decision. And I woke up, and I actually figured, no, I'm not going to get too many. And I actually didn't get anybody complain about this decision whatsoever. Yeah. I think that if, if WWE had their way, they would have just given all four of those guys contracts, but they kind of had the deal down where you got to give two on TV. Those are the rules. So Well, they can give the other two if they want to. I, don't think, well, I, I think the other two will get them for sure. Do you really? I really do. I think I'll check on that. I don't think they will. Hmm. I, 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 I mean, I, I, no, I don't think they will. I don't think, I, I, I don't think either of the two will. Really? Um, just my gut, yeah. yeah. Huh. Well, that was my, uh, my prediction is that both of them will. And uh, I don't know if they'll be on TV anytime soon, but I kind of expect they will. We'll see. The one thing last night that, that uh, I just watched it last night, but the one thing that drove me crazy was I kept watching Josh Matthews interviewing the losers. And I was thinking, uh, the role should be reversed in almost every one of these situations here. But uh, yeah, I have everything. Yeah. I, I, I tell you what, though, this was the season that I, you know, the first couple of seasons I thought that John Gaborik was quite a sympathetic character. Um, you know, and kind of a nice father figure to these guys. Mm-hmm. And this season, I just, like, lost all respect for him. I mean, he should have done it, done that run in, you know, after the first time a Holly kicked Matt, which, which, you know, and the fact that they didn't, you know, it's just like, God, you know. And, and I'm still upset about that one. But, you know, I'm sure they're going to try to turn that one into an angle if, if Matt ever makes the main roster and if Bob ever comes back from this injury without getting hurt as soon as he comes back. So I started getting upset when he was starting it very early in the season – to uh, throw his weight around, literally. Like when he yelled at that one girl. The girl who quit. Well, yeah, okay, now I will say this, though. You go through all of those physical drills for three days, and, I mean, they really put them through the ringer so they wouldn't have any jokes picked, okay? And even though the girl was whatever her name was. I don't even remember her name. It wasn't. It was, I can't remember. Was it Jamie? No. Jamie was the one that lost. No, I know, no, I know that, that girl's name was Jamie. It, was, uh, it started with a J, didn't it? Jesse? No, because Jesse was second season. Anyway, whoever the girl was that that, that, that that quit, you know, you do all that, and then you quit like in three hours, you know, after you're there. Um, I could see why they were really upset with her, especially because I'm sure MTV's going like, oh, my God, she was the only, you know, she was the only cute girl that they didn't cut because they ran the rest of them off. Yep. So that's that was Jonah's fault, too. And I guess, I guess the best I can tell you, so he's got the girlfriend. Jonah still has the girlfriend? I think so, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I'd not, I didn't expect that. But then he again... lost cable TV at some point. <laughs> Jackie Davis still had the boyfriend until she went on the road. Well, that's true. That didn't last long. No, it didn't. Anyway, let's go to Ed in San Antonio. Ed, what's going on? Hey, guys. Um, The girl's name was Jill, by the way. Jill. Jill. That's yeah, right. That's right. I knew it started with a J. And uh, what I want to talk about, I want to talk about Nathan Jones, but real quick, um, on that Top 100 book, is uh, Kerry Von Eric ranked in it? No. He, oh, he didn't make it? He didn't make it. Uh, well, I'll have to call back next week and state my case for that. But uh, anyway, on, on Nathan uh, he didn't Jones... Deserve, he didn't deserve to make it. That's why he didn't make it. Oh, uh, really? You, didn't, you don't think? Absolutely not, no. Oh, okay. No, if you go through... I mean, there, there are too many guys... I mean, there were too many guys who had too much longer careers and more successful careers than Kerry Von Eric as far as if you're going to go through and limit it to 100 wrestlers in the history of this business. Okay, well, you know, growing up in Texas, you know, it's just, I was force-fed the Von Erichs for years, so. I lived there, I too, and I was those. I was force-fed him, and, and I saw some amazing matches with Kerry Von Erich and Ric Flair, but, you know, if you include everyone who had a great match with Ric Flair, there'd be 100 people just there. Yeah, that, that's true. But uh, on to Nathan Jones, um, since they've been showing these promos, I've really liked the promos. I think the promos are really, really awesome. They're very effective. And I know he's not ready. In fact, I read some reports that he looked pretty bad at the house show. Oh, yeah, he wrestled his first one. Well, he was back last last night in uh, Saskatoon. Uh-huh. And um, what, uh, what, uh, what I want to ask is, if you were Paul Lee, what can Paul Lee do to get, to get him over? Because he does seem to have the look. He does have charisma. 30-second uh, thir- matches. 30, so just squash matches? 30-second 30, 30 second, 30 second matches. That's, that's, how you, that's how you do it with a big guy who's not very good. But it's got to be 30 seconds on TV and, like, uh, 15 on a house show with someone that can work. Yeah. So he can learn. Yeah, yeah, of course. I wouldn't go 15 on the house, the house shows because you don't want to expose them on the house shows. Maybe maybe eight on the house shows. Yeah, I guess so. 
And I, I know it's the so hard though, because you know how how does he learn? He learns on the house shows, going eight minutes in front of people. Yeah. But but you know always protect them on television and don't you know don't do the thing like they did with Batista. You know because Batista to me Batista is the prime example because you have a big impressive looking guy. And they sent him out there with Kane because he was another big, impressive-looking guy, forgetting that one guy's got to carry another. And then they had some bad matches. And, you know, even though they'll push Batista anyway, you know, the crowd doesn't buy him at all. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that uh, that he wrestled Matt last, uh, at the show. Yeah, last night. Is he going to be a face or are they going to bring him as a heel? Do, you, do they have any plans? I, I, I watched those videos and thought he was coming in as a heel. And I saw, that you know, some bookings of him as a heel. But he was definitely a face last night. <laughs> So uh, maybe they're gonna do maybe they're gonna do both um, for you know on the road and then figure out from there which way they're gonna push him on TV. Yeah, I think they should start with start him as a heel, and then I think his character will catch on as a face. Well, of right? course he's gonna eventually be a face. I think everyone knows that, but most of those guys should start as heels. Okay, and uh, let me ask one little quick question about tough enough. Um, I you know I agree with the picks this year, but uh, I really thought they were gonna pick Jonah just because they really pushed Jonah. And uh, my question is, do they have any plans to bring him into Ohio Valley anyway, like they did with Matt Morgan, or have you heard anything about that? I can, I, I, I'll, I'll try to check on that during this week. Um, the thing with Matt Morgan is, is that um, Matt Morgan uh, was pretty much Jim Ross's personal pick to win the whole thing in season two, except he got hurt and didn't have a chance to win. So you know, I mean, he's six foot nine and three hundred and thirty pounds, or whatever he is. He might even be bigger than that as far as height. He's really a big guy. I think they claim seven feet. They call him seven feet. Yeah, I don't know if he's quite that big, but um, he's a large, large man. Yeah, I mean, he's bigger. You know, he's bigger than Undertaker and Kane, and he's more agile than Undertaker and Kane. He's green as hell, but um, you know, I mean, guys like that don't come along every day. So he was going to get it. Nowinski, they loved because Nowinski was the captain of the Harvard football team. That legitimizes him. Um, and uh, he's got a good look, and he ended up, you know, I don't know. I mean, they just the, the Harvard gimmick was a was a nice gimmick that they liked. I don't know if these guys are going to get it. You know, Jonah was not that good in the ring. Um, Eric, uh, whatever. Eric's got a great look, but I mean, to me, I mean, I wasn't that thrilled with Eric because he looks exactly like everybody in OVW, and none of those guys in OVW who he looks like are going to get over and make it to the big roster and do anything because they all look the same. And yeah. and that's that. See, you know, you, you don't learn to be a wrestler in nine weeks. Um, and, and, you know, like, there are guys in developmental that are so much better than him that look exactly like him, and that's why I'm not. Well, the thing about Eric is, um, you know, they were doing all the videos and talking about, you know, he's a machine, he's really got it, and this and that. And I, I think, and I don't know why they don't do this, but you can change a guy's look. Okay, okay, but, but, but you know, Rob Conway's been out there for four and five years, and he's, you know, a good worker, too. He's getting more generic, though. No, but I mean, yeah. But the whole point is, is that they haven't figured out what anything to do with him, and they've had him in the system for they had him in their own system for two years, and he's been in Danny Davis' system for several years before that. Yeah, so, I, I think that I don't know. I just think that it should be based on talent, and once you know, then you need to worry about the guys look after that because it's like the whole thing with. Uh, well, I agree with you there, Ron Waterman. It's like oh, I don't know why he was fired, but if it actually did have something to do with him looking like Scott Steiner, well, there's a dumb reason. Would it really have been that hard for him to shave his goatee off and get a different hairdo? You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, they they had him grow hair because he looked too much like Bill Goldberg. Yeah. So, uh, and they made Batista grow hair so he wouldn't look like Bill Goldberg, too. Yep. So that's what they do. But I think this Tough Enough, the one thing about this Tough Enough is, is that if this was the first season or the second season, Eric would have won out over John because they would have picked based on look. And, and body above ability because that's what they did the first two years. Yeah, yeah, and I still don't think they really like John's attitude. I think they, I think they were kind of, I think they they were forced to pick him because he was like, the most talented. But I, I, I agree with you there. But was if Jonah was would have been a little better, I'm sure they would have picked Jonah over him. Yeah, but he wasn't. But I agree with you. We got to get running, okay? Okay, guys, thanks for taking my call. Okay, you're very welcome. We're gonna go to Dan in Chicago. Dan, what's going on? What's up, guys? I'm going to show Raw tomorrow night. Um, I got my uh, Wrestling Observer uh, live sign going. <laughs> oh, that'll be wonderful. Uh, and I got both your names on it, too, so I'm going to make sure oh. everybody knows who you guys are. Well, that's good. You may get attacked, but that's okay. <laughs> um, if, and somebody, I, if, somebody set, you. if somebody sets fire to your sign, Brian and I will know who it is. Okay. Um, <laughs> question. Do they confiscate signs anymore? Yes. They used to. Yes, they do. They do. Why? Yes. Um, why? Because they're control freaks. I don't know if they'll confiscate that sign because it doesn't have any swear words on it. And right. it doesn't, oh, okay. And it's not saying, you know, like, 
if you have a sign that says like you know Steve Austin's the world the worst wrestler of all time, they'll confiscate that. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. I remember one time I went to uh, Judgment. Uh, no, we were, I think it was WCW uh, Nitro the first season. They confiscated my sign. I didn't have no swear words in it either. Oh well, not, Nitro they were like they were they were incredible there because anything negative on Hogan they would confiscate. Oh God, that, that, that what happened to free speech? <laughs> no, you don't have free free speech in wrestling. Right. At least uh, in a TV taping. Uh, listen, do you guys know anything? Any rumors about tomorrow? No, not really. Because they said Chicago, you know, I haven't been to Raw in a while, and they said it should be electrifying because you know <laughs> it hasn't been very often. I don't know. <laughs> it's still Raw, you know. I got a couple qu- questions. Can I still be on? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. You can hold on. We're gonna go ahead and do a break right now, okay? We will be back right after this break. You're listening to Wrestling Observer Live on the Sports Byline USA Radio Network. Okay, welcome back to Wrestling Observer Live. I'm Dave Meltzer, editor of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter with Brian Alvarez of Figure Four Weekly. And we're here for two hours every Sunday night, 8 to 10 Eastern Time, 5 to 7 Pacific Time, on the Sports Byline USA Radio Network. We are going to go, how's it going? Back to Dan in Chicago. Thank you, guys. Thanks for letting me hold. Um, no problem. I wanted to make a couple of comments on Tough Enough. Um, I kind of think, I, you know, I know a lot of people really didn't like her, but I thought Jamie did really well against the guys. I think that uh, what Al Snow did was kind of cheesy on how she got cut. Did you notice how, how they did it? She didn't get she didn't get cut. The fans nixed her. Well, no, but still, but it was how it was presented that Al Snow like went up to her, and then oh oh yeah yeah well they were trying to make it dramatic. They've been they did that all season. That was their like little yeah. Thing. But no, well they, I didn't think that was right though how how it did how he did it because it made it seem like Jamie was going to be, be you know told to sit down, and then it made it look like. The other guy was going to get cut. Well, that, that that's that's part of the drama. They... I didn't like that though, because I I, re- I really think that she's pretty good. I, that's my opinion. I think she could, you know, she 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 hung in there. I, I think she's she hung almost in like a low rent China. Yeah, that's exactly. What she wanted. Yeah. So that's why I think this is going to maybe you know, you know, keep her somewhere down the line. I would be shocked about that one. Yeah, I would too. Um, and also Jonah. And I think the reason why they didn't, I think he will be in too, because the pop he got at the, at, you know, at the, the, the New York show. And I, the reason why I think he didn't make it is because that phone call he made to his girlfriend. No, he didn't, he didn't make it because the two guys who made it were better wrestlers than him. And that's really the only reason, because Jonah, had all things been equal, Jonah would have made it. Yeah, but John, yeah, but uh, Big John would wanted him out when he made that. Uh... Yeah, but all things being equal, Jonah would have made it because Jonah had the best personality of the four. The reason he didn't make it was because he was not of the four that were left. He was the fourth best wrestler, uh-huh. and that's that's the reason. Um, do you think also too that they picked uh, what? Because I, from what I heard on another show, that they had said that they rigged the uh, voting. And do you think maybe it's possible that they did that because last year the two girls won and they didn't want a girl to win? Actually, I was thinking about the voting because I thought, okay, what happens if they really want John and they really want Matt? And, and, and then people vote them off. But you know what? The people were going to vote. Anyone with a brain knew the people were going to vote Jamie off. Yeah, I, yeah. I, voted, I think that if they had voted Matt off by some fluke, they then they would have rigged. I, I think they would have rigged the voting at yeah. that point. I voted for uh, Jonah and uh, Eric because of what Eric did with that, uh, you know, one chick that that. Yeah, well, that's 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 nice, and but that's that, you know, actually, you know what? That probably killed Jamie. You know, giving him a lecture. He sh- yeah, but still, that Jamie was right though. He should have done that. <laughs> yeah, but this is professional wrestling. Yeah. The last thing, the last thing those wrestlers that go on the road want to hear is like some one of the women wrestlers go up to him and just go, "You should have mo- you should have some morals. You're a pig." Yeah, yeah. She she wouldn't last too long on the road like that. Uh, well, she would have her. Um, she would. She would be getting the uh, sunny treatment. Yeah, but I think too she might grow up a little bit on that and watching herself a little bit, maybe. Well, she may. Everyone. Everyone does. Yeah. So, all right, guys. Thanks a lot. Okay, we'll talk to you later. All right, bye bye. All right, we're gonna go to Steve in Cincinnati. Steve, what's going on? Steve. 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 Steve is not there. Steve, are you there? Well, we're going to go... Maybe we have to use a stage name, like the Sheik. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to uh, Tom in Atlanta. Tom, what's going on? Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, with regards to Hogan on SmackDown, he did everything but grab his bruised ribs in order to suck uh, applause out of the audience. I, th- I, I thought I'd seen the, the depths of Hol- uh, Hogan's uh, shamelessness when he was uh, when he uh, wrestled against The Rock there, but holy cow. Yeah, but that's the game. You know, I mean, I, I was, I'm, I'm not a big Hulk Hogan fan, but I think that Hulk Hogan... To that crap? <laughs> I think that Hulk Hogan as a 
as as far as as a guy who plays his business is one of the all-time greats in this industry. I mean, he played the Japanese card right. He played the WWE card right. He didn't do the job for Brock Lesnar like they all wanted, and he's coming back in the same exact position that he was going to get anyway without doing that job. And uh, there, there is no program with him after Vince, though, to your knowledge, right? Hello? Hello? Yeah. Oh. Did you hear me? I heard you. Um... I think that there's. I don't. I, I think that that all depends on how everything goes. I mean, there's nothing. There's nothing like etched in stone or anything like that. Now I don't know what's going on here. I think it's probably the last caller. The guy that uh, we couldn't get a hold of. They need to cut him off. Uh, okay. Uh, get rid of him. Uh, if you'd like to make. Okay. Okay. Is anybody? Is, is is Tom still here? I'm here. Tom's not here. Nobody's here. All right. I'm uh, still here. Oh, oh, there he is. Okay. Uh, just if you'd like to make a call. Ah. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Anyway, you know everything's fine. Well, we'll okay. Tell, tell us when we can go back to Tom, Brian. Yeah. Okay. Hulk Hogan, as far as how he plays his business, does it, has, a very very wise man. Yes, much wiser than Kevin Nash or Hunter, don't you think? Uh definitely. Yeah, and my, my, I used to always say that Hunter was the smartest man in wrestling, but he's not. Yeah, I, I think he was for a few months period, but uh, he is now proven to be perhaps. Not one of the smartest. No, you know what? He was smart when he, he was the smartest man in wrestling when he was good, but he wasn't smart enough to know that he wasn't good. Whereas Hulk Hogan, Hulk Hogan has no illusions to what he is and what he needs to do to get over. And Hulk Hogan, you know, if, if you know, Hulk Hogan will do an eight minute match if that's the right thing. Yeah. You know, rather than try to prove that he's a great worker because he knows he's not. Yeah. And the thing with Hunter too was he was there was a period where business was great and it was going to be great. And so he could do stuff that in another time period, like today, ironically, would have killed the business. But at the time, it didn't. So these things, these games that he played really did benefit him. But then again, Hogan, play, money. Hogan played the same games in WCW. Yeah, but he was smarter about it. Okay. Because um... when things collapsed, Hogan was not, um, he was already out of the picture, you know what I mean? Like, like uh, they were collapsing. They were collapsing all. They were collapsing all around him. And, yeah, but and, and he was a main reason. Periods were not around Hogan. Mm, him and I, 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 there were some really bad periods with with him. You know, I mean, it, I don't know. You know, when Hogan was in WCW, I don't know. He but Hogan. See, the thing about Hogan was he always had a better idea about when to step away. No, he always knew the. Actually, he always had a great game on stepping away. Yeah, like when things were really bad, he would disappear for a while, or something would happen. And so the blame would end up falling on somebody else. Yeah, no, that's Hunter true. does not do that, so the blame is, is falling on him. That's true. You're right so, about that. So Hogan is smarter in that sense. Okay. Now we are going to go to Steve in Cincinnati. Steve, what's going on? Hey, guys. How you doing? Doing really good. Uh, I had a couple of questions I wanted to ask. Um, but first, I wanted to uh, say what's up to EJ in New Jersey. He's listening to your guys' show tonight. So there's um, two people not watching the Super Bowl. I'm sorry? Okay, go ahead. Um... I wanted to ask you about uh, Ravens' release. Uh, what was uh, the reasoning for that? Um, the reason is because Raven um, and management had had different opinions, and they just decided they were going to get rid of him because they weren't going to use him. And because Ravens are really Ravens are really clever guy, and you know he he had some, he had a whole bunch of ideas for himself, and <laughs> they didn't want to push him. So it really wasn't that fun to have him around because he was always coming up with ideas for himself, and they didn't want him to get over, so it was probably best for him to be gone. Yeah, I heard that uh, he had approached uh, management about a, a new gimmick or storyline for himself. Constantly. <laughs> He's been doing that for years. And and usually they were gimmicks that were um, that management didn't quite understand. The reason I found it so... Uh, his release so bizarre was because it seemed it was just like a couple of weeks ago he was on Raw and then he's gone. Yeah, well, the deal there was it's, it's just typical WWE. I mean, what, what it is, there were people pushing to get him back on Raw because he was pushing he was pushing himself to do that. And then when he got there, the people who didn't want him there, you know, after he was already there, were just going like, we don't want him there. So they cut him off. You know, rather than like this thing of deciding before they start it, you know, what they're going to do. All right, well, um, next question I want to ask, what, did, what do you think uh, the WWE is going to do with uh, Eric Bischoff? You know, Vince, That's a very good question. Yeah. <laughs> he just got, Eric, Eric Bischoff just got screwed. 
they have that whole storyline, the 30 days thing. And well, the whole thing was to build up Vince McMahon and Eric Bischoff. And, you know, Eric's good friend usurped his heat, in, in, the, in the words of uh, Bret Hart in Wrestling the Shadows. And uh, I don't know what's going to happen with Eric Bischoff now. Do you think that it's possible that he, he that uh, they'll take him off TV altogether, or he'll still have some sort of on camera? Uh, uh, I mean, a- anything anything's possible. Anything's possible. It just depends on. Um, I mean, if they, you know, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what they're going to do. I don't think that they know what they're going to do with him anymore. And uh, my last question I want to ask is, why the hell does Scott Steiner still have a job? Why? He's big. <laughs> He's they did the same reason they hired him in the first place. Um, he, you know, he may not for a long time. I, I don't know how long he can last um, wrestling like that. But. I mean, from what I heard, I, think, I did not get a chance to see the Royal Rumble, but as I understand it, his match with Triple H was a complete snore fest. Uh, it, was, it, it was bad. It was bad. I mean... I don't know if I can call it a snore fest, because it certainly kept me awake. <laughs> yeah. But it was really, really horrible. Well, I mean, and long. <laughs> I mean, well, Steiner, his physical presence, yes, is uh, incredible, but his ring uh, presence isn't as good as what it used to be in the past, especially with the whole uh, his whole medical problems. You know, the drop foot syndrome that, that, that he's. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, everyone's like ripping on him, but the guy physically. I mean, the guy physically is a wreck, and you know, he works hard. It's not like he's lazy. He just can't do anything anymore. Well, I think the thing about the drop foot also is, Kerry Von Erich had no foot. I don't think that that's the biggest problem that Steiner had. I think the biggest problem he has is 40, and he's like uh, 290 pounds or where the hell he is right now. It's just, what can you do? Yeah. How can you have cardio at 40 years old at that weight? Yeah. Plus, plus he's had a lot of injuries. Yeah. Broken you know. down. Yeah, he's just broken down. I mean, I mean, you know, it's not just the foot. He's got a horrible back. I mean... When he had the back surgery, and this was years ago, you know, his doctor told him, you know, you can't come back. You know, you're done. And he didn't listen, and, you know, he came back. So, you know, you can imagine his back's all wrecked, his foot's all wrecked. I'm sure his shoulders and his biceps are all wrecked. You know, so, you know, 40 years old, what are you going to do? I mean, with uh, not taking his doctor's advice like that, I mean... Well, no wrestler takes their doctor's advice. You can't pick on him for that one. As far as Steiner's concerned, it's going to be just a matter of time before he's going to have to... Hang up the boots and forget about wrestling. Um, yeah, that's true. That's true. We gotta go hit your break now, okay? Alright. Alright, thanks a bunch, Steve. We'll be back right after this. You're listening to Wrestling Observer Live on the Sports Byline Radio Network. Okay, welcome back to Wrestling Observer Live. I'm Dave Meltzer, editor of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter with Brian Alvarez of Figure Four Weekly. And don't forget, we'll be, we'll be back for a second hour right after the news break. And if you're interested in football, well, you're probably not listening to us anyway. But it is 27-3, Tampa Bay Bucks over the Oakland Raiders uh, late in the third quarter. So that's the score, Brian. What does that mean to you? <laughs> not a whole hell of a lot. Is that an upset or not? Mm, I wouldn't call it an upset, no. Okay. Um, what was I going to say? Um, I, I, I don't know. This, this, this just reminded me of a Larry Zabisco story. Larry Zabisco is, who we're probably going to have on as a guest in the next couple of weeks. Larry Zabisco was at the Astrodome, and they were mentioning that, you know, the Astrodome, you know, it's a famous baseball stadium. He goes, no, it's not. It's a place to hold big wrestling cards. And what's that thing cut out, you know, uh, on the field, you know, which is like, you know, the base pads and everything. Uh uh-huh. So, anyway. So, I don't know. What kind of guy? What? Your kind of guy? That's right. You're going to be out there 50 years old, you know, doing that that old school wrestling and cutting promos on Vince? I will, yes. (laughs) That's my plan. (laughs) Well, you're not going to have enough injuries, hopefully, by then, right? I'm I'm hoping not. Yeah, I mean, because... No. Yeah, that's true. But, I mean, I give him credit. I mean, as far as uh, Wednesday night, Larry Zabisco, um, he moves pretty good for his age. I actually enjoyed that match. I expected it to be the biggest Styles clash in wrestling history, ironically. So, so did I. Styles was involved. Yes. But uh, it wasn't. It was actually pretty entertaining. No, I thought it was entertaining, and I thought it was worked almost perfectly. And yep. They're, they're going to come back. I think they got a rematch, not this Wednesday, but a week from Wednesday. And uh, they actually got a long-term storyline for, for Larry Zabisco. And they got a long-term storyline for Dusty Rhodes and Nikita Koloff, but the thing is, they, 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 can't, never wrestle. they can't ever wrestle. <laughs> because Nikita won't wrestle. I know. That's NWA. I see Dusty, and I would love to have a match with him. Hey, do you want to know something? Um, well, I'll go do this real quick on the NWA TNA thing. But um, you know that they've made all that thing about how each and every week they're going to be on in Australia and everything they on the show on Wednesday? Uh-huh. 
nobody read closely. Do you know that they're only on one, one out of every four weeks? The, Aust- the, the Australian people only want them one, one, once a month to take this, you know, basically the, their idea of their monthly wrestling pay-per-view that they lost because they, they, they McMahon didn't come to an agreement. I see. So they're on live one Thursday at noon every month. And did they say that Jeremy Borash promo was taped? Because I didn't hear that part. They didn't say it was taped, but... But it just appeared in the arena? Obviously it was. They didn't say it was live, though, either. But they... I, I thought that was quite weird as, as I watched Jeremy Borash riling up the crowd. And then they go, we're going to go to Australia with Jeremy Borash. And then they come back, and Jeremy Borash is back in Nashville doing the ring introductions. It was incredible. And they didn't even make a joke out of it, which at least that, that, that they should have done. Anyway, we are totally out of time for this hour. We'll be back right after the news break. Uh, we've got a full bank of phone calls. You want to hop in? Just you have to wait for somebody to hang up. But we'll try to go through as, the calls as quick as we can. You're listening to the Wrestling Observer live on the Sports Byline USA Radio Network. Welcome back to Hour 2 of the Wrestling Observer with Dave Meltzer and Brian Alvarez. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's get it on. Okay, welcome to the second hour here of Wrestling Observer Live. I'm Dave Meltzer, editor of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter with Brian Alvarez of Figure Four Weekly. And uh, I want to remind you that the Super Bowl is going on. Now, I, now I'm like saying that like I, I feel like I'm Tony Schiavone saying something really stupid. And the score is 34 to 3. So nobody wants to watch that game anymore, right? Uh, Tampa Bay Bucks are ahead. Anyway, we're going to go to Allen in Deerfield Beach, Florida. At Brian's request, you're up next. So, What's going on? Uh, not too much. I wanted to talk about uh, Hogan and Vince. Is Hogan going over at WrestleMania? I should I should hope so. You hope so? I think Vince will threaten until the day before that nobody would believe Hogan could ever beat him. <laughs> <laughs> and then he'll put him over at the paper. <laughs> That's right. No, I, I can't imagine. Uh, it, there's uh, Hogan has to win that match. They've, they've had some tension in the past, right? Vincent Hogan? Oh, God. Yeah, he testified against him in the trial. What are you talking about in the last couple of months? Well, I mean, in November, because he was supposed to come back in November, you know, yeah. Yeah, they had. And, uh, yeah, and McMahon what? said he was never going to bring him back, which, you know, and Hogan's back anyway, yeah, yeah, without yeah. having to do that job, so. Yeah, about four months, huh? <laughs> yeah, so Hogan's, uh, you know. Need each other? What? You think they need each other to work? Need. Well, I don't think that either needs the other one right now, but they could use... Hogan certainly could use Vince, mm-hmm. and Vince certainly thinks he could use Hogan. Right. So, there, there, there you go. Right. But, I mean, uh, the relationship is on solid ground, for what you heard. Well, it'll be on solid ground until they disagree again. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you about the Sheik. Uh, what was his relationship with Dick the Bruiser? Because I haven't read the, uh, the a bit yet. The Sheik and the Bruiser... They had their ups and downs. I mean, they had a really nasty wrestling war from 71 to 74 in Detroit. So, I mean, they've had some problems that they had. They had some problems, but they worked. I mean, they worked with each other. I mean, after they settled their differences, you know, the Sheik went to Indianapolis to work for Bruiser. Bruiser worked in Detroit against the Sheik. So, you know, I mean, when it was over, it was over. I don't. I never heard of any. I mean, I can't imagine that the two of them could ever get along because they're just the nature of the, who the two people are. But, you know, they they did business with each other, although I think, you know, there was some problems, though. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. the Sheik would never do a job for the Bruiser, even in Indianapolis, which is, you know, Not pretty bad if you think about it. Not the best of buddies, huh? <laughs> mm, you know, but, you know, and, and, and I would say early in their careers, as far as, like, you know, early 60s Detroit, you know, they were battling for that top heel position, you know, which the Bruiser had first, and the Sheik, the Sheik ended up getting it when he bought the territory. You think Hogan's going to be Brock Lesnar, because that'd be a travesty? Uh, no, I don't think that that's going to happen. I, I don't think they're going to even wrestle each other. I think they're going to keep that just from ever happening again. Okay. All okay. right. Thank you. Okay, you're very welcome. Okay, we're going to head to a break. We'll be back with more right after this. You're listening to Wrestling Observer Live on the Sports Byline USA Radio Network. Okay, welcome back to Wrestling Observer Live. I'm Dave Meltzer, editor of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter with Brian Alvarez, Figure Four Weekly. We've got a full bank of calls, and we're going to head to Prospect, Connecticut. And Jeff, what's going on, Jeff? Hi, what's going on, Dave? Not too much. One thing I haven't heard you guys talk about yet, probably because everybody just wants to forget it. What went wrong that made the Raw Anniversary Show just so horrible? Uh, Where should we start? Um, bad planning. Yeah. No planning. Um, I think something they did not deliver. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think that they have a, uh, so much on their plate that they just kind of assumed it would all come terrible or anything. There was no Austin. There was no Bret Hart. They didn't really have The Rock. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> it was just a boring show. Yeah. And they rehearsed it like twice. It seemed like they rehearsed just out of curiosity. I don't know. I don't know. They had everyone had to be at the world at eleven thirty that afternoon. You know that morning. The only thing that I can think of is uh, the guys were involved with the rock thing, just because they were talking to a video. But other than that, you know. No, but everyone had to rehearse. I mean, they had their their little lines they had to read. Yeah. Those wrestlers had to sit there at those tables had and had to act excited, like you know, going through the ring three times. Yeah. Maybe they had to learn to like. Uh, uh, you know, ignore heckling crowds going like, you know, this show's terrible <laughs> five minutes in. <laughs> it just seemed like they were just, like, glorifying just pretty much for the like, past four or five years. It was, like, nothing from, like, the early years. Yeah, a lot of people complained about it. But you know what? I mean, if you go before 1997, there wasn't a whole lot of good. Yeah. <laughs> that was the dark... It would have been more Mantar. <laughs> yeah. There was a lot of... I would not have complained about. Yeah. There's a lot of dark days there. And, I mean, like, they said, like, what was it, TLC from... Las Vegas was the best Raw match ever. Yeah, that was very questionable. I think that, that the whole idea there was to get as many guys standing on the podium for the best matches they could, and that match had like nine guys that was, or seven guys or whatever it was. It wasn't even a really good match to begin with. I mean, even though yeah, it was, I, I actually I thought that match was pretty good, but I would yeah I would never call it one of the best. Nominated like Jeff versus Undertaker. The Jeff Undertaker match. Now that was a joke to even be in the top five. That was just I I don't know who came up with that, but they need to be committed. All that stuff with like May Young being the most shocking moment on Raw. That uh, well, that you know that that was them trying to justify that their insanity really was good when it was in fact just insane. Yeah. You know, the thing about the TLC choice was it actually hurt that match because when that match took place, I thought it was really really good, but then the fact that they called it the greatest match of the past ten years. I, after it was over, I was like, oh, okay, whatever, that match sucks. When it didn't suck. It didn't suck. That was a really good match. Yeah, but it, it was like they pushed it down my throat so hard that it made me not like that match. Yeah. My other que my another question I had was, what is the plans for the Raw main event for WrestleMania? Are they going to do Triple H Steiner again? They're not going to do like Triple H Michaels again, are they? Hunter and Nash. Oh God, come on, <laughs> come on! It can't it, it can't happen. I I, I mean I, I think Nash Nash is expecting it, but I don't see that one happening like that. Um, the Raw main know. event. I don't know if there will be a Raw main event. <laughs> There's really no other strong. Uh, let me see, because you, you get Vince. Um, you know, whatever Austin's match is going to be. That'll be the Raw main event. Austin versus Triple H. What if Austin ends up on SmackDown? Well. Oh, my God. Yeah, then they can kiss Raw goodbye for real. <laughs> no real other strong contenders for Triple H. I don't see. Maybe Goldberg Rock will be the Raw main event. Oh, and they'll both end up on Raw? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think Goldberg's coming in. Well, I, I shouldn't say that. I I think there's a good chance he's not, but I wouldn't say I don't. I, you know, it could go either way now. Yeah. It's not, but it was this way. The odds of, of Rock, of uh, Goldberg coming in have lessened greatly in the last week. So. And uh, would you certainly see Steiner lasting much longer past No Way Out? Do you think they're just going to job him out there and fire him? Or um, I... You know what? I don't see him lasting that much longer because there's, you know, he's got a big ego. He's not going to want to be a prelim guy, and they're not going to want him to be a main event guy. Um, I think that they're going to try to do one more rematch with those two, which will oh god, one on one. Yeah, like an eight minute match on the next pay per view. Um, and but after that, I think that you know they're going to move Steiner down the show. And um, yeah, I don't know. I don't see the relationship going that long. I really don't. You ever see them maybe try to push like a Booker T again, or you don't think they'll do like another Kane or RVD push again? Do you? Don't you? Mm, yeah, I think they will just because they got to push somebody. Yeah, you don't think they'll put like Booker T with D'Lo and Teddy Long? And oh God, I hope not. Oh, that's a, that's a nightmare. Maybe they can't. D'Lo can complain about racism. <laughs> with Maven. Yeah. I know. Isn't that just hilarious? That would be horrible. I mean, I mean, they've been really like killing off Booker T and Goldust. I mean, they chased the titles for so long, and then they had that really stupid loss to. Storm and Regal that nobody even cares about. Yep. Anyway, we're going to get running, okay? All right. Okay, thanks a bunch, Jeff. We're going to Jack in Boston. Jack, what's going on? Hey, Dave, what's up? Not too much. Great. Um, okay, first question about the uh, 2002 Observer Awards. Yes. Um, regarding Triple H, is he the first to win Wrestler of the Year one year and most overrated another? <laughs> uh, let me think about this. He would almost have to. Yeah, nobody else. Um, I can't think of anybody else. Um, let me see who's won. Yeah, no, he would. Austin, everyone most overrated. Um, yeah, he would be the first. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Pretty telling there, I'd say. Yeah. Um, all right, another question I have. How long until Vince plays the uh, Austin Deborah beating the wife card? Oh, I don't know that he ever will. You don't think so? I don't think so. Because, because I don't think so because of. 
you know, it was fine to do before he was arrested for it. Actually, it wasn't really fine to do, but I can see them doing it before he was arrested, but uh, not after. No, the thing, the thing on that one to me is that to do it, you're going to have to make him a heel, but I think that they tried to make him a heel that one time, and it was such a mistake, I can't imagine them doing it again. Right. So well, They made so many reaches with anything that's, that's been available, it seems. Well, I mean, look at Nathan Jones. Boy, they're playing that prison stuff up for all that it's worth. Absolutely, yeah. Well, um, also, on SmackDown this past Thursday, Tony Kimmel did a very bizarre stand-up where he just announced Mysterio versus Angle and Surprise Letters Night, and that was it. And they didn't run a graphic like they normally would do. What was the purpose of that? Do you have any idea? I don't know, because it was just different. I think it was um, an idea to, to, to do the same thing but a different way. I mean, I think that they do that like at all the TVs and house shows, right? During com- Every time I go there, they, they do it. They do it during commercial breaks, but this yeah. one was on the air. I don't understand why you put it on the air, but I... I think just for a different, and... for a, just for a different feel, I think. Yeah. You know, yeah. doing the same, you know, just, you know, cro- you know, change things a little. Right, okay. That's, that's fair enough. Maybe I'm he's the reason something. the rating is up a tenth. <laughs> <laughs> I have another question about uh, replay buy rates. The replays of pay-per-views. Do they ever see the light of day? Do they ever get factored in? I mean, I can just imagine... They're, fa- they're factored in, but the numbers are so small that they're almost insignificant now. I mean, they don't even bother even mentioning replays anymore on TV, which tells you how few people must buy them. Right. I guess I was shocked. Remember we were talking about how after Sean and Hunter and that, uh, the, the uh, three-fall match, how we were talking, why did they mention all this on TV and everything like that? They did all that, and they don't even mention that you can buy it and watch it again. Yeah. They used to at least say that, where you can get the replay tomorrow if you're interested. Now it's like they make no mention whatsoever, and yeah, they, I didn't even know they still had them. Yeah, they, they still got them on Tuesday. Oh, wow. Tuesday replay. They just what don't waste. Make, yeah. They also, yeah, they also run a replay directly after the the, uh, the first broadcast. Oh, yeah, 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 the late Sunday night. That's, yeah, yeah. I think people know that. That's mainly for the West Coast people that don't right, get in right. on Sunday on time. I can just imagine some of those uh, TNA replay buy rates. <laughs> like zero. Like Because, you know, they do weekend replays of that show. Honestly, it's Sundays at, in the afternoon here on the East Coast. Yeah, well, so I, I think it's everywhere Sunday, in the after, Sunday afternoon. I don't, and I, I've, I've never heard, you know, and, and you know, I, I would get feedback from people, you know, that see the pay-per-views. I have never gotten feedback from someone on a Sunday night on a Wednesday TNA pay-per-view. I think, like, nobody actually buys them. Yeah, I think I was the first person in history. I missed one week's show, and I ordered it on Sunday, and I thought to myself, who in God's name knows about this? Yeah. Probably, probably no one. Yeah, I don't even the people in Australia know about it. People <laughs> <laughs> in Australia don't know a lot about NWA TNA. Well, they're going to uh, learn fast. Or actually, right. they probably won't. They probably won't. That's, <laughs> that's, although that, that'll, be the, that'll be the death knell of TNA, though, if they lose the Australia deal. I have a feeling. Yeah, probably, yeah. Yeah. Um, one more quick question about Steiner. Um, has anybody, in, I guess, in, in the business had this drop foot syndrome before? Is Not that I know of, because the first, I'd never even heard of it until they explained to me after, you know, Steiner was diagnosed with it. Because, yeah, I'm just wondering, like, how long they can stretch this until his foot, you know, falls off or, or something like that. If, if there's ever been anybody that's tried to stay in the ring with that kind of an injury. Well, like I said, Kerry Von Erich had no foot. Yeah. He still did no foot, yeah. Yeah, or half foot, or whatever it was, yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm just having, I'm a little kind of concerned watching the show that, uh, not not only for his health, but that, you know, it could be ten times worse than the Rumble if, if his foot legitimately gives out during a match and, you know, triple well, it, it, it's already out. I don't think that could be any worse. Well, it doesn't come in and out. I thought I heard that somewhere. Like he, oh, 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 you know, if it's not, if he's got it so taped. That right, it, right. He's got taped in that position. No, if he didn't have it taped, it could, yeah. <laughs> and he would have no control over it, and it would be, and it would be a disaster, yeah. Yeah, okay. I was I was fearing that day even more than I did the Rumble, which I was at live, by the way, and uh, it certainly came across on television as bad as it was. Don't make any mistake about that. I tried to come back to the tape and think, well, maybe it didn't sound so bad as it did live, but the uh, the cameras picked up the bad heat towards Steiner at, at every point. It was bad live reaction, in case that's relevant at all. It was starting really early, wasn't it? Absolutely. I couldn't believe it. it as soon as... Steiner, I'd say, when he threw the third belly-to-belly suplex, the Steiner sucks chant started. I thought that it was like right after he did the first flurry of punches because because I know as soon as he threw the first punch, I said to myself, you know, figuring, and no one told me they were going 20, but that morning I woke up and I go, I know, Hunter, they're going 20. And then he threw the first punch and I go, this is going to be really bad because he can't throw a punch and, and you, you know, and he can't do a match without throwing a punch. And then, you know, it was before he did like the millionth belly-to-belly. I mean, I just thought oh, this is going to be a yeah. real tough thing. One thing the cameras didn't catch was when he came out to the ring and he does that little pose on the second rope. 
he uh, he definitely couldn't make it onto that second rope because he can't bend his back. Oh yeah, yeah, when he slipped and everything. Yeah, right. I heard, yeah. yeah, I didn't I didn't really catch, see the cameras catch that when I watched the tape, and that uh, uh, turned a lot of fans in my section at least way against him, realizing that you know he could barely stand. Okay, we got to get running. Okay. Great, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Jack. We get two lines available at one 878 play so you can jump on board, and we'll be back on the other side of this break. You're listening to Wrestling Observer Live on the Sports Byline USA Radio Network. I want you to listen to Dave and Brian here on the uh, Sports Byline Radio Network, the Wrestling Observer. If you smile like the brain, you'll do it. Hey, welcome back to the Wrestling Observer Live. I'm Dave Meltzer, editor of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter with Brian Alvarez of Figure Four Weekly. And again, I want to remind everyone, uh, if you're interested in, we've got all the latest news up at www.wrestlingobserver.com, updated daily, as well as features and information on how to get both the Wrestling Observer Newsletter and Figure Four Weekly. Those are two different weekly publications, one that Brian puts out, which is quite hilarious, and one which I put out, which is, I don't know what it is, but... <laughs> it's got a lot of news every week, an ungodly amount of news. And especially this week, we'll have a tremendous amount of news between uh, the history of Tough Enough, the future of Tough Enough, the people in Tough Enough, uh, the Sheik, and the Rock, and the future of the Rock. And uh, golly, I don't even know what else is going to happen in the next three days. And that'll all be in there, too. So anyway, that's the story on that. Um, there was something I was going to ask you about. Brian, what do you know about? Do you know anything about Jamie other than she's from Oregon? I know nothing. Oh, okay. I was just wondering. I try to know as little as possible. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to Tim in Chicago. Tim, what's going on? How you guys doing tonight? Doing good. Um, I had a question. Um, I haven't heard too much on Rhino or Canyon. What's the status on those two guys? Uh, Canyon worked last night in Saskatoon, which was his first night back for WWE, but he's been working in OVW. And he looks and wrestles the same as he did before he got hurt. Um, he's pretty much recovered. And Rhino, I saw his first match back, which was um, a week ago Wednesday. Um, or actually, yeah, a week ago Wednesday in, in OBW. And uh, he looked the same, you know, in his first match back because he's looked all along. So he's ready. Do they have any uh, plans for them yet as far as where they're going to go, Raw, SmackDown? Um, you know, Canyon worked last night on SmackDown, but until he's on TV... I don't know if that really means anything. And Rhino, I, I don't know what the plan is. You know, I don't have a, know a timetable or anything like that. But he's he's certainly ready. You know, and he's the same as he was. Um, I also heard something about. I also read something about uh, adding a new member to that group with Triple H and Orton. Have you heard anything about that? Um, I haven't heard anything about it. You know, Triple H, Orton, Flair, and Batista it's supposed to be called the Four Horsemen, but I don't know that they're going to call it that right now. Ah, uh, what do you think about maybe putting a guy like Rhino? For Sean O'Hare in that group. Sean O'Hare would be a bad idea. Rhino. But I see them choosing Sean O'Hare before Rhino. <laughs> so do I, because he's taller. But um, Rhino, you know, Rhino, I think might be okay. He's he's all right. Ooh, now, do you know anything? What are they going? I don't know. For? Rhino and Batista in the same group. I don't like that. It's, it's not enough personality there. Now that I think about it. Do you know where they're going with uh, Sean O'Hare's character? It's the guy with no conscience, or trying to teach you to have no conscience. So. It's Stupid. Yeah. The problem is he still has to wrestle. Yeah. You know. You know. This is. You know. Here's Sean O'Hare's another example. You know, guys. They have all these guys in developmental, and how they do in developmental has like zero bearing on like when they get brought up or what role they have when they get brought up or anything. Because Sean O'Hare, you know, I've been wa- you know I've been watching his matches and and for the most part he hasn't looked good at all. And there's plenty of people in developmental that look better, but. You know, Nobody watches sh- developmental TV except me and Dave. I know, and, and that's really true. And uh, th- there you go. Cause <laughs> and, and they just decided, you know, that since Sean O'Hare, you know, they know him, and he used to be in WCW, and he's been in developmental for a year. He must be ready, even though everyone tells you that, even though even the t- coaches say he's not. And now he's coming back with a push, because he once had a push. I see. So there you go. But I think he's coming back to Raw, pretty much, right? I would suspect so. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, that's all I had. They, uh, someone else took my question on the main event at WrestleMania. I was thinking maybe Triple H and Austin. Just, I don't, I don't really see where they could go with Steiner after Triple H. I, I don't think they can do another match with Steiner after this one. Yeah. I think that I think just because they didn't do a pinfall the first time because they didn't realize going in that it was going to be like it was. They did the non-decision to set up the rematch, and I think that they're committed to the rematch. 
I think Hunter's pinning him in the rematch, and then that's it for Steiner. That's my that's my gut. I don't think anyone wants to see another Triple H. Unless unless Scott's not cooperative, and it would make quite an interesting story. You know, so we'll see. What do they do with a guy like Steiner after Triple H? I mean... I don't know what you can do with him, you know, unless you just... You know, he still, as of Monday, meant something for ratings. Uh, but that won't last much longer, you know, if he's a mid-card guy, you know, so... And they can't put him high on the card because... You know, people, you know, if he's going to do, like, more than a few minutes, people are going to really not react very well to it on pay-per-views. What about maybe just hiding him in tags? What about feeding him to a guy like Booker T to help Booker T move up? I don't know if Scott Snyder's going to be willing to do that. You know, the thing about Booker T, too, is I see Booker T like uh, Jericho and like Rob Van Dam, where I don't think a year from now we will be getting calls saying, God, what they do with Booker T was so great. I think a year from now we'll be getting these exact same calls. But yeah. people wondering why Booker is buried and why they don't do anything with him. I just think it'll always be like, I don't know why. but I think that they have they, they have an idea that he's good enough to be high mid-card. Yeah. You know, so I don't know. And are we still going with um, Jericho and HBK at Mania? I uh, wouldn't be surprised. I don't know that for sure. But, um, you know, I, yeah, I mean... I, I assume they're doing it no way out, and might, that might lead to mania. Oh, that's not. They were going to wait till mania on that one. Maybe they are. I don't know. We'll. Well, we got to do Jericho and Test first because of state. Oh, that's before. right. So if we're going to do Jericho and Test now, then we're going. Yeah, we've forgotten about it till just now. Yeah, and it was like such a big angle on Monday, and, and I hadn't even thought about it since since Monday night. Believe it or not. I thought it was. I've, it was so good. It was a good angle. It was the wrong people to do a good angle with Test though. Crying. What? He killed it. Yeah. Oh, that was pathetic. Test is the that's worst right. actor in the world. Yeah. The worst. You should never put him in a position where he has to act. Yeah. Okay, Tim? Okay, thanks, Scott, guys. All right, we're going to John in L.A. John, what's going on? Hey, not much. How are you guys doing? We're doing really good. Hey, um, the, uh, the, uh, the No Way Out show was the, the Benoit DDT on the apron. It was one of the, I think that was one of the, what, what, just when you think that those two guys couldn't do anything new and they pulled that off, it was just, it was just amazing. But I'm a Benoit fan from a long time back. And, I, I am too. <laughs> I, I've stopped watching the, the WWE and ordering the pay per views. I was over at a friend's house and he happened to have it on, and I said, "Oh, I wonder what." I haven't watched it in two months, and the reason is is because it's so hard to watch the TV when the guys that I want to see pushed, like you guys were just talking about, don't get pushed, and they bring in all these new guys, and and I think, at least from my point of view, and and I've got a really limited scope, and you guys probably have a lot more, you know perspective on this that I do, is that all that's left is watching is, is the core fans, and the core fans are smart, and the core fans know that the guys that they want to see pushed, the guys who actually work, who put on an entertaining match, aren't going to get pushed, and these other guys who can't work anymore or have bad reputations in the company keep getting pushed, and it's just so frustrating to watch. Does that, make, does that make any sense? Actually, it makes perfect sense to me. I don't know, Brian, what do you yeah. think? Well, I agree that there's, there's, a core fan, there's a core fan base that's left, but... I don't know if I would say that they're all smart as far as no, they, no but they're they're I think that the ones that are that the ones that have remained are smarter are than the ones around forever. The, yeah, I, I yeah, are smart are smarter than the ones that are gone. Yeah, I don't yeah. think necessarily that they all have internet connections or that they subscribe to you know. The well, they don't. They the don't. But 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 I think that they have more of an appreciation of it because they haven't been run off yet. Yeah, yeah, and if all you have left is that core of fans who's watching to see. You know, who's willing to pay for the pay-per-view to see the Angle Benoit match? Because that's the match they want to see. Yeah, but you know what? I don't think anyone bought that paper. You know, I, you know, I don't think anyone bought that mat, that pay-per-view for Angle and Benoit. I would have. Okay, but but <laughs> I would have too. But I mean, okay, but I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, I've I've followed the ratings really, really close, and and Angle and Benoit, who have wrestled many, many times on SmackDown and main events, they do not mean anything for ratings. They, you know, um, you know, and and Steiner and Triple H did. Yeah. Um, I think more people were interested in Steiner and Triple H. Now, when it's over, I think nobody wanted to see Steiner and Triple H again, and they did want to see Benoit Angle again. But I, I've watched too many years and too many awesome matches that have been rematched to horrible gates that a great, great wrestling match with two great wrestlers that gel, whether it's Flair and Steamboat or anyone else, that does not mean that you're going to come back. Even if you have to give the people the greatest match they've ever seen, if you rematch it the next month, that doesn't mean that people are going to come back unless you've got a compelling reason for them to come back other than the match itself. Well, here's a question. Okay, let's say that uh, a Steiner-Hunter segment has a ratings peak. 
Yes. Now, I would assume that those added viewers are more casual fans that are tuning in to see it. Absolutely. And those people aren't necessarily going to care enough to pay to see those two. You know what I mean? Oh, there's a big difference between ratings and gate. And the perf you know the perfect example of that is? Is um, the show last week in Japan, which nobody paid for tickets, yet it did a great rating because people are willing to watch Bob Sapp for free, but no one's going to spend big money to watch him in something that's a joke, which, yeah. which the promoters in Japan have not figured out yet. And, and hopefully they figured it out this week, but I know they haven't. Because so maybe, like, the, card, the base that they've got right now, the base of fans, maybe of those people, more of them are willing to pay to see a Benoit Angle match. You know what I mean? Even I think they're more willing to. I think they're more willing to enjoy it, but I don't see them. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't know if they're more or less willing. I mean, they're more willing to pay for it now, but I don't think they were a week ago. Look at the people that we get that send in feedback. I mean, the people that send in feedback to our site, I'm sure, would rather see the Angle Benoit match at Royal Rumble than they would have wanted to see Hunter versus Steiner. I, I got one last quick comment. If this had okay. happened 15 years ago or so, would, would this same conversation be happening about the? The uh, steamboat, uh, I'm sorry, the, the steamboat Macho Man match at WrestleMania three. You mean, you mean you, conversation? No, it wouldn't because Hogan and Andre had a horrible match and nobody recognized it at the time. Well, oh, actually, a lot of people did. But but if you had brought Hogan and Andre back and Steamboat and Savage back, Hogan and Andre still would have been a much bigger match. But it's a different fan base now, obviously. Yeah. Right. Okay, thanks guys. You guys got great newsletters. Okay, thank you very much. We'll be back right after this. You listen to Wrestling Observer live on the Sports Byline USA Radio Network. Okay, welcome back to Wrestling Observer Live. I'm Dave Meltzer, editor of Wrestling Observer Newsletter with Brian Alvarez of Figure Four Weekly. And that was actually kind of an interesting point there that was made right before the break. You know, when when they did the Steamboat Savage match at WrestleMania three, um, which at the time was generally considered the greatest match in the history of the WWF up to that point in time, and I think it probably was. They came back, and uh, I remember you know Nassau Coliseum in my mind distinctly in Philadelphia and some other cities. With, with terrible crowds, with the rematches from Steamboat and Savage coming off that. Now, they, they didn't... Now, Hogan and Andre, who had an atrocious match, although it did get over because the fans, you know... They, they, the fans, If it had been today, that match would have... Oh, my God. That's all I can say is, oh, my God. If you watch that and think about playing that, that stuff with a four-minute bear hug, oh, my God. Anyway, um, and Andre not being able to move. Um, but... They, I, they probably would have come back. They didn't, but they probably would have come back at house shows and done sellout business everywhere. You know, the fact was Andre couldn't work for like several more months, so they didn't have a chance to do it. But you know, the the clamor for another match was was pretty big. And when they finally did do another match on a big scale, which was almost a year later at um, in Indianapolis, it's still the most watched wrestling match ever in this country. Yeah, you know, on the NBC main event. So, like I said. Having a great man. And, of course, times have changed. I mean, my God, the Sheik drew all that money. And, you know, if somebody came along like the Sheik today, <laughs> you know, <laughs> not a prayer. Not there a prayer. There was also more of a mainstream audience back then because it was the boom period. Yeah, you were, today, uh, it's, it's a completely different crowd. It, 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 yeah, these, are the, these are the hardcore fans that are left. Yeah. And I really, I really think that they are willing to pay for matches like Benoit Angle more so than a match like Hunter and Steiner. Uh, pay or at least a portion of them. Some of them. I don't. I don't. I, you know. Maybe. Maybe for. I don't know. I don't know. I just. I, I just look at like. Look at. It's like the pops for Hulk Hogan. I mean, look at the pops that that guy got, but it meant nothing. Yeah. Now, I think that like a rating spike doesn't necessarily mean a whole hell of a lot because the spike is above the 4.5 million that are watching every single week. Right. And if it goes from 4.5 million to 5.2 million, those additional people aren't necessarily willing to spend any money. They may just be tuning in to see what's up. Although I have a feeling that they may they may watch. I think that those people may watch a Hogan, you know, like a Hogan Rock match. Yeah, yeah. But I think those people tuning in and seeing Hunter Steiner arm wrestling, I don't think that they're necessarily going to go. You know, I got to buy this pay per view. Um, I don't know. I think that there was interest in Hunter and Steiner. I don't think there's any any more though. Yeah. You know, and I think there was. I think there was leading into that one match. We're going to go to James in Seattle. James, what's going on? Hi, uh, uh, I was wondering, I don't know how the Royal Rumble matches are put together, if they're put together by, like, road agents or something, but it seemed to me that this one... Patterson, usually. Okay, it well, it seemed to me that this one was put together by two different people. 
at the first half you had a lot of uh, of everything that the WWF has a uh, WWE hasn't been having a lot of continuity with with angles like between brothers and tag team partners uh, a lot of putting smaller guys over like I thought Tajiri looked great in the Royal Rumble he was allowed to do a lot of his spots and for the for the whole first half it was really good and then when he got to the second part it you know started getting the typical WWE stuff where they throw the big guys in well it was it was because it was because they wanted to finish with the big guys and um you know, they didn't want the big guys in there for a long time, so they figured that they'll use the small guys. To, you know, I, I, I think that there was an idea that we'll, we'll, we'll get a lot of action in there early because it's going to be a long match, and then we have the guys who we want, but we don't want them in there for a long time, you know, and so we got to save them for the end. What a strange mindset, though, you know what I mean? Yeah. We like these, they're, these guys are big and they can't work a long time. So we'll, so we'll have them in there at the end. Yeah, but we really want them to be over. <laughs> well, I mean, they didn't even have long matches in the future. I thought that they did a really good job putting uh, Nowinski over as, as being a, sort of a crafty, cowardly heel. Or yeah, that was that was clever. He 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 was in the wrong place at the wrong time in that thing, though. Oh man, that was yeah. When they came back and Bischoff says, "Hey man, what happened to your face?" That was, oh yeah, that was pretty funny. But well, not the injury, but the comment was. I mean, I just felt like even even when they did get the big guys in, though, they did a really bad job of trying to put them over because they just came in and got eliminated right away. So they. You know, if they were trying to finish it off with the big guys, I thought it was a, a bad idea. I think it was their idea of having the big drama with all the big guys, but it didn't... You know, that, that's the one thing. The difference in the crowd, I don't think big guys, I mean, mean a thing Yeah. to the, today's crowd. They, they, don't, they, don't, they don't care about big guys. They just want to see, you know, they want to see guys... All who, the big guys are in the ring together, so no one looks particularly big. Yeah. There was, yeah. You know what? After how many years... I've probably written this for 15 straight years... And I don't think anyone in wrestling still gets it. You know, that, that whole gimmick of, you know, big guys being big, small, you know, protecting small guys. It, well, I mean, it, well, Miss Rentone gets it. That, that, <laughs> <laughs> no, she's, a, she's been in the business for a week, and she sees it right away. Yep. I mean, I figured, you know, I mean, granted, I figured out when I saw Satoru Sayama in the ring with Don Morocco and the Masked Superstar, and it was just like, okay, Satoru Sayama is like, like the most awesome wrestler, but he can't be in the ring with these two guys. And New Japan, in that same match, figured out and never did it again. And and here this is this is like 1981, so it's 22 years later, and it seems like the people running the business in our country don't get it. I mean, just like last Wednesday on TNA, when I saw Don Harris in the ring with Low Key, and I'm just going like, don't they get that like Don Harris and Low Key shouldn't be standing in the same ring together? They just shouldn't be. It makes the small guy look terrible, and it doesn't do anything for the big guy. Yeah, well, especially when the big guy's Don Harris. I mean, what can you do for a guy like that? Yeah. And uh, my other question was, I've, I've been trying to read up on Bruiser Brody, and I was just wondering. Since you guys know a lot about the history, what do you think? Who do you see his his influence in today, and what do you think his legacy is that we still see today, like in something like WWE? That's a good question. Um, I mean, certainly, I, I mean, I see it in Japan like crazy. Yeah. I mean, every you know, you know, I mean, and even more than just like Predator and ODD and these guys that are total ripoffs. I mean, you know, even Steve Williams and and you know, you know, all the guys try to work kind of like he did as far as like a big foreign guy to get over. This country, I don't know. I mean, in WWE, there's, is, is there anyone that, you know, the thing, the, thing with, the thing with Brody was, which is kind of along the same lines, I mean, I guess the Harris twins, you know, certainly tried to copy him, but they weren't any good. Yeah. But um, in, in, the thing with Brody was he was like 6'5", and he was a real at six five when everybody else is five ten he could be a big guy and, and all that. When you got you know these Billy Guns and and you know Alberts and and all this running around, it's really hard to get by doing that big guy thing, you know like when they're guys your height and much more athletic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, or, or so so I don't I don't see like like if Brody came along, I mean Brody would still because he was a good athlete, Brody would still have made it in WWE today, but he wouldn't have made it. He would have to tweak his style a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's uh, that's all I have. All right. all right. Thanks a lot. Okay, we're going to go to Keith in Chicago. Keith, what's happening? Hey, how you guys doing tonight? Doing really good. All right. I wanted to ask you some questions about that Russell One show that happened about a week or two or so, so ago. Um, I have not seen the tape, but I've talked to many people who were there and some people involved in the show, and it's it's a nightmare that I'm willing that I'm about to uh, watch any day now. Oh, I wish I, I can't wait to see this because I was reading in the Observer this week about Bob Sapp's entrance. Is that true about him coming down from the ceiling? Oh yes. 
Good he Lord. He came down from the ceiling and stole the girls from Ernesto Hoost. Well, I mean, it's understandable why. That's Bob Sapp you're talking about. Yeah. But uh, how can all Japan, like, I know all Japan has pr- money problems right now. How can they, you know, pay these big salaries for someone like... Well, this is Wrestle 1, so it's like different financiers. Okay. But they're, 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 basically what you have is these money people who are, who know nothing about wrestling. They're completely out of their mind, but they've seen how much these guys have drawn in other things, and then they've watched WWE on TV, and they think this is the way to go, not realizing that WWE, you know, I mean, the WWE is really big in Japan. They had two successful shows, but, but they don't realize, like in our country where we see them all the time, that people don't like that either. Right, yeah. and, and they're trying to change Japanese wrestling, and then they'll do something, and, and they'll, they'll get that TV rating that they got, and just go, see, this is the way to go. It's just, you know, we haven't... But, but they're not wrestling people who get it, and they don't understand, like... The stupidity. I mean, the, 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 I mean, this is stu- you know, this is stupidity far beyond anything TNA has ever done, far beyond anything WWE has ever done. When you have Bob Sapp and Ernesto, who's first of all, K1 should have never before it happens. Yeah, well, they never announced the match. That's right. It was never announced to the public. I had it on the website because I knew it was going to happen. I think I had it maybe the day before or the day of that it was going to happen. That's because I had been told, yeah, that's actually going to be the main event. They're going to shoot the angle at the beginning of the show, and but they never told anyone. Okay, but K1 should have never allowed Ernesto Hoos to do it. Ernesto Hoos should have never done it, but they threw so much money at him, I'm sure he couldn't turn it down. It, it's like, you know, you have this legend from these two incredible matches, and they ruined it by having this horrible professional wrestling match between a guy who doesn't know how to wrestle and another guy who's very limited at professional wrestling and certainly can't carry a newcomer. Right. right. And And they thought they could dress it up and... And then they have, you know, we're going to have, like, the manager interfere. You know, it's like, you know, there's a reason Bobby Heenan was Bobby Heenan, you know. It's like, you can't just take some guy from Holland who's, you know, whose sole connection to wrestling was that he was once friends with one of the worst wrestlers in history, Anton Giesink, and say, you're a wrestling manager just because he trained Ernesto Houston in a gym and probably never saw pro wrestling his whole life. And, oh, you know, what a disaster that show was. That's all I can say. Yeah, they're not going to do another one for, like, two months now, so maybe they can at least have a card done two days. Well, but they didn't. But they did that the first time and didn't learn. That's true. Every time they've just announced this stuff right at the bat. And, I mean, I mean, you know, and they keep doing surprise. People say to pay to see what surprises. <laughs> people look at TNA every week, a different surprise. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the TNA thing. That's their calling card. Uh, uh, my other question was about Kurt Angle. Yes. What do you see him doing between now and WrestleMania to set up his big feud with Brock and such? I mean, what well, are... Angle's to shoot that. I, I could see maybe them doing like a, a tag or a six man. Oh, six man. You know, on this next show, I don't really know what they're doing on the next show, but they've got a. You know, I wouldn't. I don't know, Brian. Would you put them in a six man against each other, or would you not even have them lock up till Mania? I. I don't know. I would. I wouldn't have them lock up. There's something about a six man that hmm. do what do a six man where they never get in the ring with each other except for one spot? No, because the people will get upset if they pay for that. Okay, true. But uh, I don't think I'd have them face each other to WrestleMania. I don't think I would either. Excellent. Well, thank you guys. All right, uh, we're going to go to uh, Brian in Kennewick, wa- uh, Washington. Brian, what's going on? Hey, how you guys doing tonight? Doing really good. Okay, my question's for Brian. I know the show's coming to an end, so I'll do this real quick. Oh. Um, I live over in the Tri-Cities, Brian, and we never, ever get wrestling here. I hear a lot of you guys wrestling in Vancouver, Seattle, up in Canada. When are you guys ever, ever going to come over to this part of the state? I think and we also, were Brian, there about uh, three years ago, but we never went back for some reason. I have no idea why. But uh, if you go up to WrestlingWarriors.com, that's the uh, promotion I work for up in Seattle, and send them an email, and maybe we'll do something out there. So. Okay, I can tell you. Also, can I throw in real fast? Um, I think for the night after WrestleMania, it would be cool if Raw comes to Spokane, anything on that. I think Raw is in the key arena, and I think SmackDown maybe. I think it's in Spokane, isn't it? I think, I think, I think it's in Spokane on the Tuesday, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right, thanks. All right, we're going to go ahead to our final break. We'll be back right after this. You're listening to Wrestling Observer Live on the Sports Byline USA Radio Network. Okay, welcome. Just a couple minutes left here on Wrestling Observer Live. Real quick, 34-21 Tampa Bay Bucks are ahead with a couple of minutes to go in the game, so it's actually tightened up a little bit. And we'll be out of here in about three and a half minutes or so. Actually, about three minutes. We're going to go to Brian in Rochester. Brian, what's going on? Uh, hi. Um, 
I was just wondering, do you think that the X Division has been dying in TNA since Russo and Sex has taken over the show, basically? Um, it's been downplayed greatly, yeah. And it, and it you know, it's... it's I don't think Sonny Siaki as champion has helped much. No, and certainly not that match on Wednesday that he had. That sure didn't help at all. Oh, uh, so do you think that there's any chance that any people like Bruce or... Jorge Estrada or anyone might actually get brought back or used some more? Jorge or? Estrada they're using all the time. Bruce, yeah, Jorge was back. Yeah, Bruce, I have no idea. They they use Jorge almost every week. Yeah, I... Well, he had a couple weeks off after that one match, but he's back. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what about uh, Brian Lawler? Um, I don't know what, what's going on with Brian Lawler. I mean, I, I understand he'll be back at some point. I'm not sure when, though. All right. Um, so, is it just me, or is Russo's group getting a little bit too big? Um, I think it's too big, but you know, they're you know, I think that the whole deal, deal is they want him managing basically every heel. So, you know, that's that's the deal. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. We're gonna go to Donnie in Atlanta. Donnie, what's going on? Hey guys, how's it going? Going pretty good. Um, I was listening to a conversation you guys were having about, you know, whether or not the casual fan would care enough to order the pay-per-view or, you know, the people who will... Well, they'll order WrestleMania. Well, yeah, but also I think that what was overlooked was the fact that, I mean, these guys will buy merchandise even though they may not buy the pay-per-view. You know, I mean, I'm looking at ShopZone.com now, and, like, there's more Hulk, uh, Hulk Hogan merchandise being sold there than anything else, and it's been like that even before he came back to television. So I think that, you know, even though they may not be willing to buy a $35 pay-per-view. Um, they would be willing to maybe buy merchandise. Um, I think they'll always be willing to buy, you know, colorful Hulk Hogan merchandise because it's kind of like this timeless classic thing. But right. but that doesn't mean that you should push the guy in main events. Well, I mean, I mean, past, past a, cur- a certain point. Because I do think that Hulk Hogan will be effective for about a month or two. You know, right. but the problem is, is that he'll get the pops forever, even long after he'll be effective. Right, right. Yeah. And also, I mean, you know, like I said, if, if they're not buying the even the pay-per-views, they'll still spend money elsewhere, and Vince is going to be making money off the advertising. Okay, well, we've got to get running. You're right. As far as if it, if, it, if it moves TV ratings, you can make money off the advertising. That's true. Anyway, I want to thank everyone for calling in. I actually expected me and Brian would just be talking for two hours since there was a Super Bowl going on, but uh, we had a full line the whole time. We'll be back next Sunday night. We're going to have John Molinaro, author of The uh, Greatest 100 of All Time, so we can talk about... All the great wrestlers in history next Sunday night. We'll see you then. You're listening to Wrestling Observer Lot on the Sports Byline USA Radio Network.